Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming back to our podcast. I'm here again today with James McNeil of Life Transitions on Day of the Dead, November wow. 2nd. How ominous. How <laughs> ominous. I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, James, may not be familiar with the, uh, the Day of the Dead, but uh, it's, it's something that uh, but you and I had spoke a little bit off, off screen before we started this recording about maybe uh, yeah. providing some education to listeners about it. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'm sure as we'll kind of go back and forth a bit here that uh, it's funny, we've just come through Halloween also. And if, if you notice uh, every year you get to sort of see a, a, a gallery of costumes and more and more as the years have gone on the last you know few years anyway, you see these kind of day of the dead type uh, skull faces with the flowers and, and it's it's uh, uh, often um, if you thought like why why is that person like that? Well, they're they're kind of images that hearken to the the Day of the Dead celebrations in Mexico and the and the history with those. There's a male and a female character. Uh, there's Spanish names, so I'm going to butcher them. So I'm not going to try to say them there. But but uh, people are often aware of like the, the 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 white face and then the dark eyes and your and it's not like a like a scary skull. It's more like a happy skull. I'm not sure if you. Have you noticed yes. that? Yeah, I, I noticed that little kids, adults, and uh, and of course, I don't know why. What it is about Halloween in North America? It seems to be uh, the one time of the year that uh, your aunt can be the uh, the sexy cop or the the sexy mortician. You know, it's like they're they're dressed up, but it's like the the sexy version of the mouse or whatever. Anyway, so uh, but yeah, yeah, Day of the Dead. As far as my understanding, I'm not. I have no Mexican heritage, uh, but the uh, definitely. Uh, uh, a time of remembrance kind of thing really uh, plays into the uh, the uh, your 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 family members that have that have died before you, and so it's a it's a time that uh, my understanding that the that their 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 memories are kind of uh, they reemerge through photos, little altars people people would uh, build in their ho- have in their homes, mm-hmm. and kind of like it's sort of like that the veil between uh, death and life uh, gets a bit blurry and. Uh, and families uh, remember and honor and celebrate grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and people that have died before them. Uh, certainly, uh, the last couple of years, there was a, I think it was a Pixar movie um, called Coco that was yes. a, uh, was like a build on another movie that was about a decade earlier. But it really kind of played on those traditions and uh, all of that symbolism. And uh, I'm pretty sure I watched it with my kids and, you know, great, great songs and all that. But, yeah, clearly... Uh, uh, you know, rooted in the Mexican culture with a, a merging of uh, uh, indigenous uh, religious uh, ideas and symbols and Roman Catholicism all kind of smeared together. It's a interesting hodgepodge of uh, not so much celebrating death, but I guess like celebrating your loved ones. Is that is that how you sort of take that? Yeah, and, and it's more of a sub- celebratory type of uh, theme yeah. as opposed to... Um, it, 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 anything else and it's yeah. uh, it, it's it's uh, it's certainly unique to that mexican culture as as you had said yeah uh, but it, it is interesting isn't it yeah i i think so for for sure like we uh sometimes even uh, you see pictures or clips um whether it's in spain or in portugal and at first glance they almost look like these kind of day of the dead kind of little parades but there'll be some kind of a very unique to that region uh people walking with uh with uh, figurines or carrying, uh, 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 you know, statues of of uh, uh, silk draped skeletons, and they're but it's more of a Roman Catholic uh, thing. I don't, it's just yeah. yeah. There's a lot of a lot of things that are uh, like death has always been part of life, and uh, you know the the more ancient a culture is, the more their roots and their um, the connections to death being you know really in the next room. Uh, are, are more right. more deep in certain cultures than, than say for our you know for example our culture we seem to have uh you know we're living longer all the time uh you know even people that you know you can you my my, my father-in-law has beat cancer three times now I mean, he's <laughs> like, like he's indestructible but uh but but you know like we're we're living longer and, and we're almost like pushing death out to the margins where which I think, sadly, as we've as we've discussed, makes it even harder for people to talk about death, because it's you know it's it's like you know on the list of well, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, you die, you know, and no one wants to go there, but right. uh, but you know, so we we don't have a lot of 
uh, in towns in Canada, people walking or having prayed with a bunch of skeletons or something, unless it's Halloween. But yeah, interesting. Yes. yes. And then one of the things that I learned as well, James, and you, you may have seen this online too, was that there was a, uh, the beginning of a, a James Bond movie was oh, um, yeah. Yeah. tied in with the Day of the Dead celebrations, I guess, in Mexico. And yes, it, it actually... The, the feedback uh, to that after the movie was released, I guess, um, ended up resulting in some sort of larger festivities regularly taking place in Mexico, which I believe was in Mexico City. Yeah, yeah, that that kind of I uh, resembled what was done in the movie. So it's it's kind of interesting of our art imitating life or life imitating art or that kind of thing. I, I I just come across that myself too. That that. Uh, uh, I, I thought those parades have gone on for generations, I guess. But uh, Spectre, I think, was the name of the movie, W 7 So that was maybe, I don't know, five, ten years ago. I'm not even sure when that movie came out. But uh, so to, yes. to, dis to discover that, that all of a sudden, like, wow, hey, there's a good idea. Let's do a parade. It's like, wow, I thought they were already doing that. But uh, Well, one, one of the things that, uh, that I found interesting was that uh, I had – when I was looking into this and researching this Day of the Dead, this annual celebration uh, yeah. over this time of year, uh, I wondered if there would be any information available online pertaining to uh, the concept of, of people actually planning ahead for their ultimate death by, right. Right. you know, having a will and, and prearranging yeah. what they want to have happen, whether they want to be cremated or buried or any of these other important things that they could be tied into this. And right. I couldn't find a thing. I went through all kinds of websites and, and learned about the food and the and all the other uh, cultural <laughs> types of things that that people do um, right. pertaining to this holiday. But I found nothing that pertained to, to actually uh, being proactive in this way. Right. I, I, and yeah, the Day of the Dead comes around every single year, yeah. uh, just like every single one of us will die. And and so, yeah, interesting that uh, I guess it kind of lends itself to more, as you said, that it's more of a, a celebration than, uh, hey, let's get down to brass tacks and uh, get our will together because Day of the Dead's coming kind of thing. Maybe, maybe right. someday, maybe, maybe that's going to be uh, one of the effects of this podcast. People saying, well, you know what? Next November, uh, when Day of the Dead rolls around, we should make sure we've got our wills in order by that point. You know, we've yes. made our plans. We've had a real conversation about not so much a parade, but, you know, what do our kids need to know uh, before we go kind of thing? Yeah, right. like, there you go. Yeah. And and actually across Canada, more and more jurisdictions um, across the provinces are, are actually starting uh, make a will month. Uh, so there's there's various provinces that are now taking part in that, which is uh, which is great. But it's a, I just would have thought that the Day of the Dead might have some sort of hint in there too that people should be planning ahead because no one gets out alive. Yeah, that that's right. Well, I think you're 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 brilliant to bring it up in this podcast because that's the uh, often we come around to that. Like let let's get our heads on straight and let's let's plan for the inevitable. So it's you know you 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 can't get away from. Uh, the, uh, the, the mortality question when you talk about right. Day of the Dead because it's Day of the Dead, which yeah. I will be someday, you will be someday, and yeah. Uh, so yeah, why why uh, why let it be chaos when the inevitable is coming? You know that's yeah, this uh, this could be a new tradition for the podcast that uh, getting closer to the Day of the Dead. Hey, have you made your plans yet? And, yes. and I don't mean and I don't mean the casserole. I mean, have you uh, have you uh, <laughs> have you got your plans in order? Have you started that conversation? Yeah. Yeah, because as you and I know, there are so many benefits to actually being proactive in this way. Sure. Oh, big time, big time. I it seems like when we we speak on you know every other week or when we're when we're doing these, uh, it tends to be a Thursday for some reason, and by the time Thursday rolls around. We're very fortunate that we, we're known as uh, open conversations are happening all the time in our office or online and whatnot about pre pre planning. And by the time Thursday rolls around, we've usually met down met met down. We've met with uh, sometimes about a dozen people that have uh, are, are in process. Sometimes they're at the end of the process. They're actually pre paying pre funding their funerals, right. or they're they're saying, you know what, we've just come to grips with the reality. <sighs> that we're going to die. So what do we need to do? And and this conversation yeah. happens. But yeah, usually by Thursday, Friday, whew, uh, we're exhausted because we, uh, we're explaining the same things. So we get good at it, but uh, sometimes come away thinking like, what are people thinking? 
you know, it's yeah. not easier to die without any plans. It's just not. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, we're, we're right along with you that pre-planning, it just makes sense, but we, you got to be there uh, mentally, spiritually to do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. And, and that's a whole topic in itself, James, that we can, yeah. that we can certainly talk about in the future. One sure. of the things that you and I had, had spoke about uh, earlier was this whole aspect of how our society is changing in yeah. regards to being more of a, a, a melting pot, a multicultural society of all kinds of backgrounds, uh, which Canada always has been, sure. uh, I, I guess, to a large degree, but even more so today. But uh, that's one of the things that I've been hearing within the uh, bereavement sector, and I'm sure it's affecting other uh, sectors of our economy as well. But uh, I, I just wanted to, to talk to you briefly so that our listeners would have perhaps a better insight in regards to maybe what uh, things that you are seeing, uh, because you're working right in that bereavement industry. I'm not. I used sure. to. But sure. uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, you, you're right. We uh, from from the time that I was a kid growing up in the 70s to today, uh, whatever century we're in. Um, yeah, we, when you look across uh, anywhere, uh a, uh, a food court, uh, the plaza, even the line at Tim Hortons, you're seeing a lot of different um, cultural representatives. You've got a, here's a guy with a turban. Here's a, a an Asian looking lady. Here's a, uh, a guy with blonde hair, blue eyes. And like, we're, we're a real mix and our indigenous brothers and sisters, we're, we're a real mixed bag of, of people. Yeah. And the world gets smaller all the time with, you know, the, we see what's happening around the world with conflict and that just, you know, the masses are moving. So in, in our world, as uh, as funeral directors, every family has their own story, for one. But then when you when you weave into that story, um, very specific cultural needs, then that really affects the, the, the way that we would the way that we would be serving a family. We're always listening for what what is needed, what's going to help them get through this. But uh, if, for, for some cultures, uh uh cremation is is a must it must happen uh and the family must be there and other cultures it's the opposite cremation would be an abomination so it must right. be burial uh as soon as possible and um uh, and so the way that we would serve a muslim family or a, a practicing jewish family a hindu family um a uh, a buddhist family uh, or your average kind of Heinz 57 Canadian family. There's uh, there's there's all kinds of different traditions. Now, of course, you, as you know, you've got friends that are uh, would have a different heritage, and some people say, well, we're you know we're a technically we're a we're a we're a uh, uh, we're a Hindu family, but we're not practicing. That's like right. we're you know we're, we're Jewish people, but we don't go to synagogue, or you know, hey, I'm a Catholic, but. I don't go to mass and, and people like that. So sometimes we have labels that we, that we, uh, that we, we wear willingly, but some people are really active in, in their traditions. And our role is not to become, I don't become a Buddhist or a Catholic or whatever, but uh, my role is to come alongside and, and learn what they need and find all of those, uh, all those trigger points that are going to help them most efficiently. And uh, you know what, and a great example is uh, when we serve a, uh, a practicing Jewish family, the uh, we're, we're very much just kind of the foot soldiers in many ways, because I'm not Jewish. They know that, but we we're acting as a, as a transporter uh, to, to the synagogue, uh, to the cemetery, uh, moving, uh, moving a person's casket. But, but the, uh, the gentlemen, the women and the gentlemen at the, uh, the synagogue do many of the, um, the the funeral body preparation needs and it's that's off limits for us, which I'm I'm fine with. I'm fine with the you you do your thing. We're just here to serve you in whatever manner you have. So sometimes the more uh, uh, staunchly adherent to their cultural practices, the more I'm we're really not involved in the center of that. If you know what I mean. If you've yes. ever been to a Roman Catholic uh, funeral mass, similar. Uh, I'm not Roman Catholic. I've got lots of great Roman Catholic friends, but as your funeral director, uh, we're arriving to the to the uh, the church right at mass time. We're processing in with the direction of the priest. Casket is up at the front with the pall, and then we just basically sit in the back row for an hour while everything happens there. All the the, the mass kind of runs itself. Well, it run by the servers and the readers and whatnot. The end of the right. service, then we come in and we're kind of the foot soldiers again. But uh, uh, often, yeah. 
And I know in larger centers like Toronto, you have Jewish funeral homes per se and, and Muslim uh, funeral providers and things like that, that cater very much to their, their community and would participate more than I would. But, uh, but yeah, I, I find it very, very interesting and have the, the utmost respect to, for people that, um, that really have figured out that when, when death comes in the family, uh, there's a lot of comfort in traditions. And um, and they look different for everybody, but yeah, I think that's. Uh, have you found that back in your and your, in your, going back in the memory banks, the different cultures you've served? I have, and I found it fascinating as well. And and I can appreciate where you're coming from because the the, the area that you serve, James, is 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 that I would believe, state that it's more of a mid-sized type of uh, urban area, and, and including a lot of rural areas around you. Yeah, but oh, yes, I've oh, worked yeah. in Toronto for quite a number of years. Very large city, and um, seen all kinds of different faiths and uh, cultures and backgrounds, and and uh, right. highly respect those traditions as well. But um, it, it, do you do you do you find it changing uh, now? Do you do you find it getting more diverse? I I guess. Well, for for sure. Like just a real time uh, example. My wife and my kids and I we moved here to this small community, Chatham Kent, twenty years ago. And uh, we moved from London, London, Ontario, which isn't, isn't Toronto. It's not New York City. But we, coming here was like, wow, this is a small community. We love, my life, my wife and I love Indian food, like curry. And we right. came to town, we thought, where's all the ethnic food? There was literally not a single restaurant that wasn't, you know, your standard kind of, you know, you know, whatever Canadian food is. And there wasn't a sushi place. There was nothing like that. And I even uh, talked to a, there was an Indian family that ran the variety store up from the funeral home that I was managing. And I said, because I walked to the store, oh, and I could smell their food because they lived there also in the back of the store. I said, where do you guys go to have food in a restaurant? They said, we have to go to Windsor. And anyway, this is 20 years ago. Now here, 20 years later, there's, uh, uh, in, just in our small community, there's, uh, it seems almost there's a sushi place on every corner, Indian food, uh, 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 Lebanese food, right. like really, really, really great, great food. If you like, if you like really like, you know, uh, enjoy uh, food from other countries. So just in our small community of uh, this, this is a, this represents like a hundred thousand people, Chatham, Kent. And so just in our small community, uh, huge changes with, with people coming to Canada, new Canadians, and w w which is great. I, I, I love it. I love it. Yes. Yeah, that's that's good. Well, it, it, it certainly seems that this trend is is going to, to keep going and our, our multicultural country is going to uh, keep uh, going in that direction, which is uh, fine and understandable. Sure. Uh, it's, it's just that I've, I've heard within the um, bereavement sector from from some people, they, they find us, I guess, especially with uh, those perhaps working more so in the cemetery side of things, uh, are, are have found it a little challenging to kind of keep pace with all the changes, uh, sure. considering that their types of, of cultures have been steeped in traditions from, you know, more of a, a, a narrow sector going back many, many years. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Well, when you mentioned cemetery, I know there's there's no Muslim cemetery in our immediate area, but there's one, you say about an hour from here, and there's there's now two mosques in Chatham, Kent right. also. And uh, so I, I know, say, we've not had a chance to serve uh, a Muslim family yet, like a practicing Muslim family, but I would think that uh, they would essentially geographically be forced for burial, which would be their, their, their choice, I, I believe, uh, they would be either going to London or Windsor for an actual burial because there's no sort of Muslim ground, so to speak. And I can understand them wanting to stay together for sure, for sure. Right. If, right. If, I, if I lived in a Muslim country and there was a small section of Canadians in their cemetery, I'd say, maybe you should bury me over there with the other Canadians, I guess. I don't know. You know, but, yes. but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's uh, interesting. I find that the cultural shifts with us, uh, you know, heritage Canadians, I guess folks that have been here multiple generations, huge cultural shifts just within those communities where, uh, I don't know, go back 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, where, where it was safe to say, even if you weren't a hardcore Bible believer, uh, the only show in town on a Sunday was church. Yeah. Everything was closed. It was a different world. And when, uh, when people died, they were church funerals, they were burials, uh, pastor so-and-so, father so-and-so, 
Uh, but we have moved so far away from that where you can literally say without any kind of exaggeration, it's the opposite. Most people do not go to church. Yeah. Most people do not have those kind of those kind of traditions. Even the what used to be called the Christmas and Easter crowd. You know, the folks right. that went to church Christmas and Easter. Yeah. Even the what you know, some of us church people call the CE, the CE crowd. Uh, they're almost non-existent also. So you've got all these people that deal with the inevitable, as we call it, death. And without any of those 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 traditions, you're seeing that effect on the funeral industry where when you sit down with someone and say, well, now is is there is there a pastor I can call? And they all look at each other and go, Pat, what are you talking about, pastor? I say, well, do you guys, <laughs> are, you go to a church? They're like, church? And it's, it's they don't go, their parents don't go, and their grandparents. So you're talking like, sometimes a minimum of three generations that are removed from organized religion and right. all that goes with it. And that, that greatly affects what happens when someone dies, where there's not a necessarily a, a community that's brought together that says certain things that we agree in or, or agree on or sing certain songs and do certain things. So the funeral industry, you know, moves really slowly. You know, some people, some companies yes. have not understood that our country, uh, our culture has been changing quickly and they keep trying to maybe say, well, you need to do it like this consumer. You need, this is how you do funerals. And the consumers are going like, we don't want that. I don't know what you're talking about. So there, there's, right. there's a shift in the industry where either you kind of move with the culture or you could try to champion the past and say, well, this is how it was done in the past. What do you think? You want to try it out? You want three days of visitation? Oak casket? You know, uh, you know, yeah. do you want to, all that kind of stuff. So it's a uh, it, uh, the the wise industry people are knowing that there, there's a there's a fine line to navigate and serve people without uh, putting expectations on them, but also guiding them to say, hey, you got to get through this in some way that's going to help you, as opposed to let's let's you know get rid of grandma and move on kind of thing. So there's right. a real balance. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying, James. And that's one of the things that that I think the funeral industry has, to a very large degree, has done a very good job on is, is helping survivors um, continue on, on, a, on, on, on a good grieving process, yeah. uh, a good grieving yeah. path, as opposed to getting involved at, or bogged down in complicated grief, which, had, you know, maybe <laughs> in, in, I'm sure in some cases can't be avoided depending on the situation, but... I, yeah. I, I, I certainly think the funeral industry has has done a, a good job in that regard. Yeah, well, I, I I would like to I would like to think so. You know, there's there's a there's there's great actors and there's bad actors in every industry. Yeah. And uh, when when uh, uh, yeah when 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 the the service provider yourself myself puts the puts the the customer first, and that sounds so corny, but when you do that, when you're you're seeing your your level of service. Uh, is more important than the bottom line because sometimes you know you, you could think well I could really push and uh, make more money on this transaction and right. run the risk of them walking away going oh my goodness that was horrible or make less money and have the customer walk away and say wow I was I was listened to I was served uh, I felt respected and they're likely to be your return customer you know so yeah, yeah, that's right. We tend to get back what we put out. We yeah. reap what we sow. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's uh, certainly uh, I think a good way to sum up this this podcast here today, James. Well, let's uh, let's uh, cap it off here for today, and we can always uh, reconnect on another interesting topic that I'm I'm sure will uh, get some attention out there with listeners. Hundred percent, hundred percent. It's good seeing you, and I, again, I love your background. I don't know if you're. <laughs> It's like you, you got you got out on a day pass. You're out walking around the yard. I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for your time, James. Okay, Greg. You take care. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.